She's the push she brought from the Bronx, New York. Follow her voice, a stray dog is nice. She's the push she brought from the Bronx, oh yeah. Don't be surprised if you want to listen twice. Make decisions, find the right choice. Know yourself better, find your own voice. It's okay if you need help today, because everybody needs a little push. From the push she brought from the Bronx, New York. Welcome, Transformation Talk Network listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart, and I am the pushy broad from the Bronx. Welcome to my show, Recovery Recharged, where we share advice and support from experts in addiction and recovery. And most of all today, happy Valentine's Day. If you love it, if you hate it, it's February 14th. It's that time of year again when we think about love and romance and chocolate all at the same time. So I thought it would be very appropriate this Valentine's Day to talk about how we feel about ourselves, how the world sees us, and how we feel about how we look. I am very attuned to social media, just like everybody else. The Pushy Broad is out there. I have a website. I, I do radio on TTN. I also have the, the required social media um, nuances. And I am very concerned a lot of times about what I see and what I hear on the net. So I know that the social media and the internet in general bombard us with information about dieting and weight loss supplements and all of those things so that I always feel either good about myself or not so good about myself. And I know it's really confusing for a lot of us out there. And there are a lot of inaccuracies as to what good eating is all about and what improper eating really is. So we look at social media. We look at Facebook, we look at Instagram, and of course we look at TikTok, and we see what's going on and who is making us feel good about who we are and who's making us not feel so good. So I decided to bring in an expert, someone that can help us navigate this and understand, especially on a day like today, that on Valentine's Day, we need to be able to love ourselves most of all. So I have with us this morning a woman that I know for a very long time and has been a guest of mine before. Her name is Dana Wells. She is a licensed professional counselor. She is a licensed nutritionist and a registered dietitian nutritionist. She's been in private practice since 2006, and she specializes in weight management, eating disorders, addiction, trauma, and sports nutrition. She has a certification from the American Dietetic Association of Adult Weight Management and is also a certified personal trainer through the National Council of Strength and Fitness. I don't think I could have brought a, a more wonderful specialist to this program today. And today we're going to focus on how the internet and social media impact our food choices and impact our body image. The Pushy Broad from the Bronx and Transformation Network on Recovery Recharged welcomes my friend and colleague, Dana Wells. Good morning, Dana. How are you? Good, good morning, Ellen. I'm fine. How are you? Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you so much. So let's kind of get right into it. I mean, you gave me some information that I really want to focus on here. You you, you talked about some new research from the University of R Vermont about content on TikTok related to food. Give us an idea about that a little bit and what's happening in general on social media. Well, in social media, but particularly TikTok and things that kind of draw your attention in, they tend to focus on things that release 
kind of receptors from the brain or something called dopamine that gets clients like drawn in to something over and over and over again, almost like someone who um, is an alcoholic or an addict of some sort. So they're really going in and trying to get clients and individuals sucked into a message over and over and over again. And most of these messages can be negative in terms of, you know, either not the right information regarding food or certain type of body type. So for example, if you're following someone that has a certain body type, they're going to release more and more and more and more and more individuals with that body type. And if someone is comparing themselves to them and has a completely different body, that can be very triggering for them and um, can cause some issues for their overall kind of mental health. It's very interesting to me. Well, first of all, you're right. When you go to social media and we look at somebody that we like, no matter what, that body type is going to keep appearing again because that's how the algorithm is triggered. And so we all know that. But it was also very interesting to me to note that most of the viewed content on TikTok, according to the University of Vermont, is related to food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and a lot of the the information and a lot of the uh, pictures about food are not necessarily not accurate or things that individuals might crave um, and be triggering for them. Um, it's not necessarily going in a direction of what is health and wellness. It's more about things that can be very triggering for clients, especially clients that have eating issues. And I know what that's like because I have my own share of eating issues. And it's really interesting because you pointed out something that that here on Recovery Recharged, we understand. We understand the brain of an addict. We understand the brain of someone that wants to use drugs or wants to use alcohol. But sometimes we don't understand the brain of somebody that is addicted to food or addicted to gambling. And what you're saying is that some social media platforms drive the urges of dopamine so that it has this coming back over and over again, simply because we keep like and following and commenting on social media. Is that right? Yes. And moreover, what, what tends to happen for individuals do, who do have that addict personality is that it causes them to actually cycle through and either binge or you know restrict more because these things are keep, keep releasing and releasing and releasing it becomes very triggering for them so it can exacerbate the problem that they may already have or it can contribute to you know it turning into a problem so when you say cycle through can you just explain a little bit more about what that means so for example, I might go on to TikTok and see, um, let's say it's Valentine's Day and a chocolate. And for someone who, um, you know, maybe has an issue with sweets or chocolate and is trying to steer away from that, maybe in their, their, their main meal plan, and they have a problem with that. If they click on that, or if they like on that, what happens is now that algorithm, like you said, picks that up and shows them more pictures of chocolate and maybe a chocolate cake or a chocolate dessert or a chocolate recipe or where to go to get some chocolate. And, and so if you can think about how when we start thinking about something and over and over again, it makes us want it even more. So now they're in the cycle where they can't stop thinking about like, you know, wanting to have that chocolate. And when they were just simply kind of waking up in the morning and liking something on, you know, maybe a friend said, oh, look at my husband gave me or, you know, significant other gave me a box of chocolate and then the algorithm picks that up and starts showing them all sorts of different types of chocolate. Does that make sense? Yes, it does because it happens to me all the time. So yeah. it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I have to stop liking chocolate cake recipes. Right. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's going to come back to haunt me. I re I understand that. And that's a really big thing, especially if someone who has a chocolate addiction like the pushy broad. So mm -hmm. I get it. All right. Something I'm not doing anymore. So in general, nutrition and weight perpetuate a toxic diet culture among teens and young adults. Can you talk about that a little bit and why you think that's the case? Well, I think society at large um, has this certain standard that um, is unattainable for a lot of individuals, especially it's a certain age range. Um, and so people start to kind of compare themselves to that. And it can be very, very difficult for someone, you know, who is a teen and doesn't really, you know, starts looking at something that's supposed to be the norm when it really isn't. 
Um, and so it can make them start feeling bad about themselves or comparing themselves to other individuals that aren't necessarily, um, you know, what society is at large. So what kind of unhealthy behaviors could we see in a team that is not getting uh, good vibes from, from, you know, from watching social media? What, what happens? What do we look for in a teenager that is beginning to exhibit unhealthy behaviors from this toxic culture? Oh, there's so many, but I mean, the top ones is, the, you know, seeing a teenager start talking about dieting. Um, start eliminating certain food groups, you know, like, oh, I'm, you know, I've decided to be a vegetarian or, you know, I'm not going to eat carbohydrates anymore. That's that those are biggies. Um, starting to wear kind of loose baggy clothes or making comments about their body um, that you hadn't heard before. Um, and then also following these, you know, kind of these certain types of um, of TikTok uh, influencers, you know what I mean? So I have a client who recently was following a couple influencers that were bodybuilders. And she started saying, I need more protein. I need, I need to, you know, people need to drink a gallon to two gallons of water a day. And I said, but what, what type of individuals, right? Is that a six foot individual who is bodybuilding or you who is five foot one, you know what I mean? And, and 12 years old, you know? So um, just kind of seeing them starting to follow things that aren't don't really relate to who they are as an individual and their age or if they even need to be, you know, dieting. Um, I don't even believe in dieting, right? Um, or changing into a certain food culture that doesn't really represent who they were. It's really important some of the things you said because I see all the time from my own clients as well, not only females, but males as well, that all of a sudden will be taking all kinds of supplements because they see somebody on social media and they start lifting more weight than they're able to, or they're working out in the gym in a way that is well over exertion, even for 15, 16, and 17 Absolutely. years old. And there's a great danger in doing that. But also sometimes they have really toxic and unhealthy behaviors, like maybe patterns like binge eating or anorexia. Is that correct? Yeah. And, you know, we see a, a more and more of this um, since COVID and social media getting bigger and bigger. We see so many clients that are, that start restricting um, and move from disordered eating into anorexia nervosa, which is extremely dangerous or binge eating disorder, um, or bulimia, where they're, you know, they're, they're eating food, and they're so, you know, obsessed about the fact that they ate it, and it was a bad food, which w there are no bad foods, and then they're trying to get rid of it. So there's, there's, there's several different things that we see um, with young teens and young adults um, that, you know, transition from disordered eating into a more severe eating disorder. We're going to talk about some of those acute eating disorders a little later in the program because we want families and especially moms and dads to recognize that either in themselves or in their children. So that's important to go over. But let's come back a little bit. I want you to talk to me a little bit more about body, how body impact image impacts social media. There's something called social comparison. Can you talk to us about that? Well, social comparison is when an individual compares themselves to another person or someone in a different status. Um, and they start, you know, comparing themselves to, um, you know, and, and, and are comparing their body to another person's body and then judging them based on that body. So, you know, they might see someone and be like, well, you know, I want, or I don't have legs like that person. Or, you know, I don't have um, a body type like that person and I need to have that body type. So that's that's comparing um, and it can really be damaging to to the individual. And, and, and I think that there's two definitions. There's an upward comparison and a downward comparison. Can you give us some concrete examples based on what you've seen? Um, well, an upward comparison would be comparing someone, comparing yourself to someone who... Um, is again like not it's not even in their um their 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 same type of body type at all and then a downward comparison would be comparing themselves to um to someone that uh that um is like so for example i i am not an athlete so they would be comparing themselves to someone who who is an athlete and judging their body based off of that 
I see. So, so it's it's almost like it's you you can't compare apples and oranges, right? You you have to have compare apples to apples. So yeah. I can't compare myself to an opera singer if there's no way on this planet I'm going to be an opera singer. Or you know, and and the same thing with body image and weight. Okay, I am you know five three, and I'm not six foot one, and a, and a supermodel. So exactly. those comparisons comparisons aren't real. And we find a way to make them real. And that's when social media has a very negative impact on our lives. And yeah, I mean, and the thing is, what happens is this distorted body image, right? So you start comparing yourself to someone who's six, like you said, a six foot supermodel and you're five two. And you get this distortion of, well, why can't I look like that? And you start looking at yourself in the mirror and comparing yourself to something that you'd never be able to aspire to, to be like, and that's where, you know, that, that, that distorted body image comes into place. And now you start looking at yourself completely different. Like you look at yourself in the mirror and you don't even see you, and it can be really dangerous. And again, the more you see that, that six foot model on social media, right? It comes up over and over again in your Instagram feed or your feed. Now, all of a sudden, you're, that's all you can see. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and what's even more interesting is that it's not only a disease, so to speak, of young adults and teenagers, because a lot of your clients are every single age group, correct? We all go through this. Absolutely. I mean, I, I have two clients who are in their 60s right now. And I, you know, my lung, my, my youngest client and my practice is nine. Um, and my oldest, my oldest client is about 69. So, you know, there's a very wide range. So it affects all of us. It absolutely does. And and when we find these standards that are unachievable, uh, unachievable, as a woman who's really trying to love themselves, we start to feel, I guess, very negative. How does this how does this manifest? What do you see? Do you see anxiety, depression? What happens? Um, yeah, I mean, we see a lot of anxiety um, because individuals are constantly trying to change something that they that they can't change within them about themselves. And so then they become um, depressed, like I'm doing something wrong, or I'm not good enough, or, you know, because I'm not like this person or don't have this body type, I'll, you know, I won't be able to um, have friends or or be popular. And it really can lead to some serious mental health issues. Um, anxiety and depression are, 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 the, are the biggies. Um, and when we start in disordered eating patterns, that also leads to to anxiety and depression as well. And on how does it affect relationships? What do they tell you? How does they reflect relationships with their partners or their family? Um, it, I mean, it's extremely stressful because, you know, you might have a, a partner or a loved one that, you know, they're constantly saying, you know, you're beautiful or you find the way that you're fine the way that you are. And, and they, you know, either dismiss that or don't believe them. Or, you know, you think about when you're in a situation where someone's constantly depressed or anxious you know, it's hard to meet them where they're at. As far as how it affects families, um, you know, it can put a lot of stress on the family because they they want to be able to help their, you know, their child or their loved one. Um, and they're kind of getting in their own way. Um, and, you know, when someone's depressed, it's it's really hard to, to get through sometimes. And if they feel self-conscious about themselves, I'm sure it doesn't lead to great relationships. It doesn't lead to uh, a good sexual relationship with your partner, right? Because they're always trying to cover up or they're always thinking that they don't want to expose themselves because they don't like the way they feel. Like body dysmorphia. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So body dysmorphia is when an individual looks in the mirror and doesn't see what's really there. So, um, you know, they'll they'll th they'll see themselves in the mirror and sometimes you know I'll, I'll get clients to draw like a picture of themselves and it'll be much bigger much larger than they actually are and that can lead to all sorts of issues individuals don't you know when in extreme extreme cases they don't want to leave the house they don't want to go to social events they stop going to the gym because they're embarrassed of their of their body size they start dressing differently um, you know, like you said, they get really insecure about their body. So, you know, it, it affects their in intimacy and it also affects their ability to make new friendships because they don't think they're either good enough or they're embarrassed of themselves. Um, so it really can lead to some extreme problems. 
And are you finding that there's no real difference between how men feel when they get into situation than women? Are there some more distinctive characteristics when men feel this way? I think the only difference with men is when they um, compare their bodies, it's usually more muscular. Um, and sometimes the body dysmorphism is like uh, they, they think about I'm not big enough or I'm not muscular enough or I'm not strong enough, where if women, it's more about being, you know, kind of like society's almost Barbie type of body, right? Like being petite and, you know, full breasted and, um, you know, things that are really unachievable and, you know, outside of on a Barbie doll kind of, you know, so. All right. So when someone is suffering with a real issue and really has an acute eating disorder, how does social media and the internet impact these people? There are several different ways. First of all, um, there's individuals that are pro uh, eating disorder. So you find information about that that feeds into information about that. And there's- Wait a minute, what does that mean, pro eating disorder? So there's there's actual sites out there that support kind of that, that anorexic or bulimic type of um, behavior. So explain can, to us, for all of us out there, explain to us exactly what anorexia is and bulimia is. Many of us think we know, but we want to hear it from an expert. So anorexia is a restrictive disorder. Um, it is when individuals restrict food. Um, so anorexia is actually means not taking in a certain amount of food. Um, so anorexia nervosa is when individuals restrict um first a lot of times it starts with just one food category like i was talking about carbohydrates um and then um they start restricting other things such as fats um and eventually they are you know they they lead to like kind of hardly eating at all in severe cases uh bulimia nervosa is when individuals take in food and purge it um purging can be several different things it can be actually throwing it up it can be abusing laxatives it can be um through excessive exercise um, you know, exercising like three, four times a day, things of that nature. All right. So how does social media impact these people? You said something very disturbing, pro eating disorder. That's awful. Yeah. So there are, um, when, you know, just like any, any other platform, um, if individuals start looking for anorexic information, it can go to a place where there's helplines, right? So there's the National Eating Disorder Association, there's inpatient facilities, you know, there's there's my practice, things of that nature, or it can go to individuals who actually celebrate um, anorexia. And so, you know, there'll be individuals that are showing themselves in a restricted form. And that can be very, very triggering for young adults and very influencing for, for young adults. Um, in, in, in the middle, it can just be, you know, an individual looking for diet, you know, kind of different diets. And then that algorithm will pick up more and more dieting. So they'll get more and more ideas with more and more misinformation, um, you know, and then all of a sudden they're kind of just, they're scared of food or they're getting rid of food because this food is bad and this food is bad and you shouldn't eat that. And, you know, um, there's so much misinformation out there. So give us an idea about how... How looking at social media again, not only um, it activates the brain's dopamine center, you know, which is kind of a feel good chemical reaction, but talk about a little bit how some of the studies show that the longer exposure to social media can have an indirect effect as well. Well, the longer you're exposed to something just like, so for example, the longer you do something, you can you can get addicted to it. So the longer you're exposed to something over and over and over again, and the more dopamine and the more receptors are getting released and released and released, you need more and more of that, right? So all of a sudden, you know, the individual that, you know, the young teen that started in their room and, and started looking at um, certain type of diets and they get triggered by, you know, kind of this, this, this recipe or, or this particular ad, um, the more that that triggers, the more that that releases dopamine and the more they need to keep looking and looking. So now you have someone that has problems getting off their phone. It's the same thing with, you know, I see clients with diet apps. They do the same thing. You know, they're entering things 
they're they're seeing how many calories and every time something drops down another calorie now they like they need to enter something else and enter something else and all of a sudden their day is filled with getting into an app right and seeing these numbers over and over and over again and it gets to the point where they just can't control it I'm really glad that you said that because there are many apps out there that are quite reputable. And even though they talk about the psychology of eating, still measure that in terms of logging your food and counting calories. And and what you're suggesting is that may not be helpful in some cases? In some cases, it may not. I mean, a lot of these apps are great and they're they're good tools, but that that's what they're supposed to be used for, just sim- simply as a tool. But when clients start using them um, to basically map out their entire day and how they look at food and how they look at exercise, um, then it becomes a problem. You know, it, it, it's supposed to be used just as a tool, not as something that you're kind of living your whole life by. All right. Well, we're going to, in a few minutes, we've got two more minutes before we take a short break. But in the meantime, the first thing I want to know, and and I want you to tell our listeners, is where can they find you if they have questions and they want to talk to you about things? Where can you, where can they find you, Dana? Uh, They can find me at uh, rd at anewonline.com. My private practice is called Anu, A-N-U-E, or they can look me up, you know, they can Google me, my Dana Wells. Um, And we have a practice here in Pennsylvania. So um, either one of those, they can, you know, they can kind of Google me and, and find me there. Dana Wells, that's W-E-L-L-S, R-D at A-N-U-E.com, correct? Uh, rd at a new a n u e online.com online.com okay rd at a n u e online.com you can certainly reach out ask a question or you can go to pushy broad from the bronx.com or you can leave a message for me at 800-889-1757 and i will put you in touch with dana when we come back i want to talk about how you don't like the word diet. That's the wrong four letter word. And I also want to talk about how we can find the good things on social media that have to do with body image and the new things that, um, that major media companies are doing to enforce positive body image in the media. Okay. Stay tuned for the pushy broad. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Transformation Network listeners. I'm Ellen Stewart. I'm the pushy broad from the Bronx. Happy Valentine's Day. We're talking about body image and social media with my special guest, Dana Wells, who is going to do her own show on the Transformation Network, I believe sometime in the early spring, called Ditch Disordered Eating with Dana. And I want to start there. First of all, congratulations, Dana. Just give us a brief idea of what we can expect from your new show. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, So... What my show is going to be about is really focusing on changing one's relationship with, with food and the uh, this concept of disordered eating and eating disorders. We see a lot of disordered eating in the United States and uh, pretty much around the world. So it's about making that distinction about what is disordered eating and when are you going into almost like an eating disorder and how is that impact- impacting you and your relationship with yourself and your body? Um, and really thinking about how you can change your relationship with food so you're not experiencing disordered eating or an eating disorder and you can have a more fulfilled and healthy life. I can't wait. It sounds very exciting. And of course, one of the major themes you're going to cover is how diet is a four letter word that you don't want in anybody's vocabulary. Tell us about that. Well, I don't like the word diet for several different reasons. It just has a negative connotation to it. Um, As Pat always says from Transformation Talk, you know, it has the word die in it, which we're going to talk about one of these days. And it's true, you know, it stopped dying from dieting. This is one episode that I want to do. It's just when people think about the word diet, it, it automatically makes people think about restricting, right? It makes people think about eliminating food. And we shouldn't have to think about that. We should really think about food and um, how it nourishes our body 
and you know how to make good choices. And those choices can be a variety of different foods and all types of foods. It's just about, you know, eating things in moderation. All right. Well, especially today on Valentine's Day, let's try to eat that chocolate in moderation. Mm -hmm. So let's go on to some of the things that are positive in terms of how social media is making a positive image. I know that you want to bring up some specific things. So talk to us about what you've seen on social media, which has a direct positive effect on body image. Well, there's been so many um, individuals and bigger organizations that have been really focusing on body positivity and, you know, really loving yourself for who you are and not comparing yourself to anyone else. Um, being an individual, and I think that's so important in today's society because I think we lose individuality. I really like Vogue's cover. I don't know if you've seen it coming up with in March. Um, all body types, all different ages, all types of women, and all, you know, showing their their beauty right and and so vogue is really doing a great job with that dove also in 2003 put out a whole kind of you know love yourself and 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 you know and who you are and so there is a lot of positive reinforcement out there as well i know we've been talking about negative reinforcement for the first half of the show but if you start changing your your um your approach to things and your your apps you will actually get some positive things coming up and and there's a, there are a lot out there to help individuals feel better. So about we're themselves. talking about we're talking about a real beauty campaign, mm -hmm. right? To celebrate the physical variation of women and encouraging them to be confident and comfortable in their self in themselves, right? Is there something that you want to tell us about the Council of Fashion Designers of America? Um, well, the particular designers of America are the Vogue world or you're you're referring to the the Vogue worldwide campaign. Yes, yes. Yeah. And 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 they're really uh focusing on again just individuals uh being able to explore their beauty at all body sizes, all body shapes, all races, colors, gender. Um and they're really encompassing everyone as an individual and everyone should, you know, love themselves for who they are and the, the you know the unique features that they have. And um, you know, I just really love that them for that. And that's coming out of Europe, which is just wonderful. Fantastic. And you're right. I've seen those Dove commercials. I've also yeah. seen um, yes, body wash and maybe underwear commercials where women of all body types, um, even even uh, feminine hygiene products showing all women's types, which is a wonderful way to make us feel more comfortable. So Give us some advice about those of us like myself that keep looking at the six foot one supermodels. What do we do on social media to stop generating those algorithms for ourselves? Well, I mean, what I like to do, especially for my teens who, you know, are always kind of looking at, at things in through a not the best light is find someone that is more like you, right? Or, you know, someone that's at least your size or your your in terms of, you know, I'm five, five I'm five one. Right. So, you know, why am I looking at someone that's six one? Right. And um, being able to start researching or having things in your algorithm that are more in line with who you are and what you're looking for. And I think that it needs to be bigger than just what we look like. What are the things that you value about yourself? What are the things that you want to aspire? Do you want to be a, a pushy broad from the Bronx? Or do you want to get involved in, in, in helping people? Do you want to get involved in um, the environment? Do you want to get involved in being an executive, right? Donna Karen, right? You know, she, she's, 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 she's great. She's successful. She's not 6'1". She's not a supermodel. She's super cool. You know, so if you start kind of following that that individual or those certain kind of things, what's going to happen is that the, the algorithms are going to pick up on that and you might get an inspiration from that. Right. So looking at the bigger picture. And also maybe looking at the bigger picture, not not only concerned with body type, but maybe change of style, right? Maybe there is a hair, you know, a, a hair color that you want or a design or or you want to wear something different, right? Not only to focus on the physicality is what you're saying. 
Absolutely. You know, who, you know, who do you aspire? Who, who, what, what fashion do you like? Um, you know, what are the things that you're interested in? That's what you should be looking for. You know, what makes that individual a whole person, right? There's more to a supermodel than just a supermodel. Right. She has hobbies. She has likes. She has interests, just like you do. What are you good at? What do you want to be good at? Go out there and start the algorithm in a different direction. It's all possible. Absolutely. And then, of course, you always say, put down the phone, put down the computer, right? Engage in the real world. I always say that, you know, we spend so much time looking down and I, I'm constantly telling my clients and myself, look up when I'm walking to work. You know, if 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 I'm looking down at my phone, number one, I, I, I could bump into someone or trip over something. But secondly, I don't have the the engagement that I that I should when I'm walking down the street, I try to smile at people. I try to say hello. You know, I, I, I might see, you know, um, you know, a, a flower or a color. You know, we're so immersed in something that's not even real, really. Right. It, it, I mean, if we just look up and look at what's around us, there's so much to explore out there. It snowed yesterday and I and and. I barely saw anybody sledding. And I said, why, why aren't people outside in the fresh air? You know, they're sitting home in front of their computers, getting addicted to an algorithm. You know, they should be outside having a snowball fight. It's the truth. The kids need a snow day. And, you know, science is telling us and research is telling us that the average time spent in front of social media and the phone is somewhere between four and five hours a day. That's staggeringly hor horrific. I mean- yeah. We have so much time to do so many other things. So what is the line? If we need help because we cannot do these things and because our body image is just completely negative, give us some examples of where to go and how to get help. Well, in your local area, you can basically call around to um, individual therapists or individual registered dietitians. If you're struggling with eating disorder, or disorder eating, I would definitely go to a registered dietitian. Um, I don't want to, um, you know, necessarily say that health coaches and other things don't know, but you want to start if you really feel that you have a problem with someone that has the evidence-based knowledge to be able to treat that specific type of, um, of disorder. Uh, also therapists in the area that specialize with eating disorders. And then there's the National Eating Disorder Association. There's the American Dietetic Association. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, uh, local inpatient or outpatient residential uh, things in your area. So you can just kind of Google eating disorders and see if they have things in your local area. I start to, I like to start local because you can usually get in to see someone, but you know, there is the, the, um, like I said, the uh, American um, eating disorder foundation, they have a, a lot of resources there as well. And of course, we know all of the treatment centers, and we know that there are a great many books on eating disorders and body mm -hmm. image. And also, if you're in the state of Pennsylvania, you can work with Dana. So Dana, tell us again how we can find you. Uh, uh, RD at a new A-N-U-E online.com, or you can just Google Dana Wells, a uh, registered dietitian and licensed professional counselor. Or you can go to pushybroadfromthebronx.com. Or you or can go to Ellen. Yes, or you can go to me and I will direct you to Dana, 800-889-1757. Okay, so here we are now. We want to be able to look at some of the warning signs before we give permit people permission to do the things they want to do on this very special day. Let's take a look and see how we can recognize some of the warning signs of the very acute eating disorder behaviors. So give us some ideas of what to look for and um, and what to do about it. Well, I know we touched a little bit on it before. Like I said, um, you know, recognizing a loved one that is starting to um, out of the blue start restricting, um, saying that they can't eat certain foods or you know, eliminating entire um, food groups such as starches or fats, things of that nature, um, isolating, wearing baggy clothing, um, also individuals who uh, start over exercising to an extreme. So going to the gym three, four times a day, um, often um, we'll also find our parents that they'll catch their kids throwing away food um, and, and, and hiding food. 
Uh, also, you know, um, individuals who start complaining of like stomach issues or being sick, um, sometimes, you know, they'll be actually purging. Wow. And also, I know you've mentioned this to me before, avoiding mealtimes altogether, right? Playing with food on the plate. I've seen that a lot. Uh, and maybe weighing oneself multiple times during the day is a really big sign. I know you've said that too. So um, you've talked about bulimia as well, but there are other as you know, as acute, but not as serious as um, anorexia and bulimia, like obsessing over food or binge eating or compulsive eating. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. And binge eating disorder has a whole subset of, of health issues, um, you know, and, and so that's not something that we want to overlook. Um, and, you know, the way that you can experience individuals with binge eating disorder in the home is often you'll find that like just food goes missing um, or individuals are, are eating at night. Um, you know, or just like eating a really large portion of food that's, that's different than their normal size portion. I mean, you know, in a, a, a a um, adolescent teen can, can, you know, eat like three cheeseburgers, but, you know, someone that you'll find, you know, is eating a large amount of food. And then also often we find with the binge eating, they'll be purging that. So they'll disappear for a little while into the bathroom um, and they will be getting, getting rid of it. So just eating large amounts of, of food or having, you know, cravings of, 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 of different types of food that they can't seem to, um, it can't seem to get enough of that. I, I hear what you're saying. And also, of course, some of the other things that you've said to me, significant weight gain, frequent dieting without any weight loss at all, hoarding food you mentioned to me before, maybe eating much more rapidly than, than normal, and then eating until feeling uncomfortably full, right? So if you're experiencing those things, then you may be suffering from compulsive overeating or binge eating, correct? Yeah. And, and, you know, starting to have fear around food, you know what I mean? Um, or feeling like you, you know, you really can't have, you can't be around a certain type of food. Um, and, and, um, also feeling like if you eat, then you have to exercise. Right. Uh, also what we also find kids that, uh, start drinking a lot of like liquids and a lot of water and, and supplementing that for an actual meal. That's something that's common as well. Wow. <laughs> I, you know, when you gave me this, okay, according to the eating disorder statistics estimated by the National Eating Disorder Association, in the United States alone, up to 30 million people suffer from an eating disorder, just such as anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, or binge eating disorder. Worldwide, the figure is more than 70 million people sufferers. This is a real thing. And it is much more insidious in many ways than addiction of substance misuse or alcoholism, because we have to eat to live. So Dana, we thank you so much for the work that you do, because this is a very important topic. So let's go down the list here and talk about Valentine's Day. Is it a difficult one for clients? How do we navigate it? How do we feel about it? And most importantly, can I have my chocolates today or what? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think Valentine's Day can be difficult for, for individuals for several different reasons. Number one, as all holidays, um, there's always a food component to it. Um, number two, you know, individuals that, um, don't have a significant other might struggle a little bit. Um, and, and individuals who already feel insecure, um, they might feel more insecure. So it can be very triggering. And then just the candy in general, you know, I have, um, an individual that I'm working with right now who was very concerned about going out to dinner and eating with her husband because she is struggling with binge eating disorder. And she, you know, she wanted to go out and celebrate, but at the same time, you know, food makes her nervous. So there can be anxiety and, and depression and fear around this holiday. So when we think about, when I try, try to think about Valentine's Day, I think about it as a day to share love, right? And that could be with your family. That could be with your friends. That could be with yourself, right? Go get a Manny and Petty. Bring a couple chocolates with you. 
there's all sorts of way that we can celebrate, um, you know, a day and, and have a Valentine that isn't necessarily someone that you're intimate with. And are there any health benefits to chocolate? There's tons of health benefits to chocolate. Um, I, actually, <laughs> I know. Well, I actually downloaded a specific, um, a specific article um, from John Hopkins. Antioxidants in dark chocolate have been shown to lower blood pressure. Um, they reduce risk of clotting and blood circulation to the heart. Um, they lower the risk of stroke and coronary disease and death from heart disease because of those properties. Um, for me personally, the benefits I feel are mental health because chocolate makes you feel good. You know, I love a good piece of chocolate, dark chocolate. Um, if you can enjoy your sweets without having a negative connotation to them or saying they're not bad, everything in moderation, we wouldn't, you know, even too much broccoli is not a great thing, right? It doesn't make you feel good. Um, too many supplements are not a great thing, but small things in moderation are good for your mental health, right? So um, so it's it's nice to, to treat yourself without feeling guilty. So what that means to me is that I have to go out and buy the small box of chocolates. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's no reason to get something that's, that's large because again, we wanna try to eat these things and choose these things in moderation. And for some people, if chocolate is really triggering, it's hard to keep that box of chocolate in the house without walking by and getting another, another, another. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've eaten too much chocolate. You know, we're all guilty of eating too much of one thing or another at one time. But if it's something that it's really hard for you to kind of have and not, you know, kind of overdo, getting a small box of chocolate is 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 perfect. And then sharing it with someone. I always love sharing things with people. So it makes you feel that's, better. That's really nice. And if you have a partner out there or you're planning on buying something for your partner, and you know they do have a problem with eating or overeating or compulsive eating or they're worried about chocolate, number one, don't buy it for them. Buy them something else, mm -hmm. right? There's flowers. There's all kinds of other things to do on Valentine's Day. But if you want to buy some chocolate, you don't have to buy the biggest heart in the store. Absolutely. Buy just a taste. So if somebody finishes the whole box, it's only four or five pieces rather than that hundred piece box you can come home with. So what else do you suggest to your compulsive overeaters or your binge eaters that they can do to begin to heal and to look at food differently? Well, I think it's really all about how you approach your, your meal plan and how you approach foods in general. Um, often individuals who are binge eaters or um, struggle with eating disorders, they're looking at um, certain diet plans and certain meal plans and, and certain things in social media that don't really teach them how to eat properly right? You shouldn't removing, remove a food group. The American Heart Association, the American Dietetic Association, the American Diabetes so Association, all the associations over and over again said, say the same message, eat balanced, right? Whenever I like to say, whenever you're having an E, have a B. So whenever you're having something that provides you energy, so that would be a carbohydrate or a fruit, you want to have something to balance that out, a protein or a fat and then have a vegetable or, you know, something like that with it. So you really want to try to balance your, 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 your foods throughout the day and give yourself permission to eat that variety and eat those different food groups um, in a way that benefits your body. And so what you're basically suggesting is to stop dieting, right? Absolutely. And, and then convert to what you consider to be a good path with food, right? A combination of food groups. Mm -hmm. And what about portion size? Well, portion sizes are going to be really related to the individual. And, and this kind of goes back to my client that was saying, you know, this personal trainer said that I had to drink a gallon of water and she's like 4'11 and she's 12 and, you know, she's not an athlete. So portion sizes are very important. But it has to be a portion that is um, related to your body weight, your body type, your metabolism, right? Um, and, and so you really need to speak with a professional to be able to help you with that, right? Um, because again, even if you go to a, a, an a algorithm of how many calories you're supposed to have, my football player 
who's six one and fifteen is going to have different portion sizes than my musician who is six foot one and fifteen. So portions are it's it's good that we understand what our por what portions are, but we also need to know what the portions are in relation to us. A certain calorie um, bar for one person could be a snack, right? And for my athlete, that would be like nothing. You know, they'd have to have four of them to be even have a snack, be even a snack size. He'd be eating 12 ounces of protein where this, you know, other kid might be eating six ounces of protein. So what you're saying is one size does not fit all when it Absolutely comes to not. Plan. I understand. Okay, so give us some alternatives. How do we really handle social media? What do we do? And what can we do to focus on other things rather than just the food intake? Number one, I think that deleting apps can really be helpful. Picking, you know, the apps that you find the most triggering. Secondly, if you find that you're constantly in a cycle of something that makes you not feel very good, change that. So once you start changing what you're following, the follow would, will start changing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So if I'm following something that's really negative and I switch that to a positive, like positive af af affirmations, um, you know, um, things that are, are individuals that um, are more aspiring, then the algorithm is going to start picking that up. So I would, I would kind of shift what you're, what you're searching. And some good coping skills for us. You know, that's the other thing is, you know, there are so many other things that we can do besides get information off the phone, look for evidence-based research, pick up a book, um, and, and, you know, coping skills are going to be found, um, not so much in the phone, but out here. So breathing, um, five senses, what am I seeing? What am I feeling? What am I touching? Um, being able to journal is great. Listening to music, going for a walk petting an animal. If you're an animal person that, you know, get yourself out of the phone and, and go pet your dog, go for a walk with your dog. That is so therapeutic. Um, there are good apps out there. I like the calm app. Um, you know, there, there's others that, you know, can help with like little five minute meditations. Um, I'm not a great meditation person, but there's guided ones that are really great. Um, so really, really seeking out things that will help you cope. Um, and not coping with food or exercise or, you know, over-exercising, I should say. Um, All right. There's a lot of well, better, better ways. Fantastic. All right. We've got about 30 seconds. One final thought for our listeners today about having that chocolate today and about how to minimize social media and where we can find you, please. Um, be good to yourself. Uh, there's a lot of good information out there, but there's a lot of negative information. So pull your way out of the negative and go to the positive. And again, redirect yourself, try to, try to, um, find things in the, you know, out here in, in, in the world, as opposed to inside your computer or on the phone, reach out. Um, and you don't necessarily have to have chocolate for Valentine's day. You can have a pedicure, you can have a manicure, you know, you can, um, have a, have, have a talk with a good friend or go for a walk. Uh, you know, you don't, you know, it isn't all about chocolate, but if you, if you want to have that chocolate, go ahead and do that. Thank you so much, Dana. Well, she's coming up with a new show in April called Ditch Disordered Eating with Dana. This is Ellen Stewart, the Pushy Broad from the Bronx. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. This is Ellen Stewart, the pushy broad from the Bronx, saying thanks for listening. And remember, everybody needs a little push. From the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York.